What does Una Belon, Rita Rio, Rita Shaw, Anna Novella, Rita Novella, and Eunice Westmoreland all have in common? They're all the same person, better known as Dona Drake. And how was she linked to a mob boss and Marilyn Monroe's clothing designer? Well, in today's video, we are going to discuss the exciting but dangerous life of Dona Drake and why her life story is so fascinating. Let's get into it. So who was Dona Drake? Dona Drake was born as Eunice Westmoreland on November 15th, 1914, in Miami, Florida, to Joseph Westmoreland and his wife, Novella Smith Westmoreland. She was one of five children, and as a child, her father relocated his family to Philadelphia and later opened a restaurant, where Eunice, who was musically gifted and talented, played instruments there as entertainment, but eventually quit to pursue her dreams of singing and dancing. By 1933, Eunice moved to New York City with her mother and a waitress named Renee Villon. Eunice then changed her name to Una Villon as she went on to form a sister act duo with Renee. The duo danced in several nightclubs as chorus girls until the pair eventually found work at the Grand Line's popular Paradise Club on Broadway. Grand Line was a friend of actress Jean Harlow and had helped her advance her career and was known to hire many chorus girls who went on to become famous. This is also where Eunice was noticed by Earl Carroll, a theatrical producer, writer, and composer who went on to cast her in one of his Vanity series productions. This led to a review written by Paul Harrison printed in the Indiana Gazette stating that she was a noteworthy newcomer and comparing her to Anne Pennington, a famous actor and dancer during this time. This also led to columnist Walter Winchell writing a review about one of her nightclub performances, referencing her exhilarating dancing and stage presence. It was stated that Eunice and Renee separated at some point due to Renee getting married and from there, Eunice Westmoreland went on to pursue her dreams solo and became one of the most sought after actresses and performers during the 1930s and 40s and had what was known as one of the most diverse careers. Now, what makes Dona Drake and her story so fascinating? Number one, racial ambiguity. Donna Drake was very light and fair skinned. She was around five feet tall and during her prime, she was around 90 pounds. Her features consisted of thick, curly black or dark brown hair, angular features with blue green eyes. She was described as stunning, a bombshell and a knockout. Basically, if you saw her, you would do a double take and probably stare. Because of her ambiguous look, Eunice often presented herself and was perceived as Mexican and went by the names Una Novella and Rita Novella and eventually Rita Rio. And she was typically cast in ethnic white roles portraying characters that were native, a gypsy, Latin American, and Middle Eastern. Which brings me to my next point. Number two, she had a secret identity. So as I stated, Eunice, AKA Dona Drake, presented as Mexican and sometimes white depending on the circumstances, but it wouldn't be until years later that it was discovered that she was actually a black woman with black parents, her father originally being from Arkansas and her mother originally from Alabama. The U.S. Census reported that her grandparents consisted of one black couple and one couple being black and white. Now, how did this secret identity begin? Well, there's not a lot of information on the internet about Dona, so we don't know exactly when she took on this persona, but it was said that a studio publicly announced or claimed that she was born Rita Novella in 1920 in Mexico City and stated that she was half Mexican and a quarter French and a quarter Irish. 
So from what I've researched, it's not clear if she initially presented herself as Mexican and people latched on to that, or if she presented herself as Mexican because that's what others assumed or perceived her to be and she just ran with it. Regardless of how it came to be, we do know that that was how she presented and she also even learned Spanish to protect her chosen identity, which made it even more convincing. I also read that not only did she hide her racial identity, but at times she also hid her age, sometimes going by age 20 while actually being age 26 which is not as uncommon because actors at times do conceal their age or play younger or older just depending on the role. But it's different with Dona because not only at times was she concealing her age, she was concealing her identity. There is a difference between a black woman going into play or portray a Mexican woman versus a woman pretending to actually be a Mexican woman playing a Mexican woman. Number three, the girl with the many names. So with Dona concealing her identity, she also took on many names. So she was born as Eunice Westmoreland and at the very beginning of her career, when she worked in nightclubs as a chorus girl, she went by Una Bellon or Una Villon, matching the last name of her sister act partner, Renee Villon. This was in 1932. At some point early in her career, she went by Rita Novella, Novella taken from her mother's first name, and some sources stated that she also went by Anna Novella. In 1935, she went by the stage name Rita Rio when she was featured at the Paradise Cabaret on Broadway. It was also said that she changed her name to Rita Rio to emphasize her ethnicity and spice up her image. She then formed an all-girl orchestra with a woman, but due to the financial issues with the group in 1940, she went on to Hollywood and screen tested under the name Rita Shaw. So as you can see, she had many aliases or stage names. To me, it seems as if anytime there was a big shift or a significant change in her life, she changed her name. I just wonder if this caused problems within the industry or if she had a hard time keeping up with the different names. Or was this her way of mentally coping and moving on from one stage of her life to the next? Number four, she was a multi-talented musician. It was stated that Dona learned to play music as early as the age of five, which led her to performing for customers in her father's restaurant. Now, it's not clear which parent or who taught her how to play music, but from what I've researched, she was described as a very gifted child when it came to music, almost as if she perhaps was a musical prodigy or very naturally inclined when it came to music. Throughout her career, she played the piano, trumpet, clarinet, saxophone, and drums. It can be very challenging to learn one instrument and she was well versed in several in addition to also being a talented singer and dancer who went on to become an actress. So this woman was multi-talented on many levels. It's not often where you run across someone who can dance, act, sing, and play multiple instruments and be strikingly beautiful on top of that. She was such a talented musician that it led to her forming an all-girl orchestra, which leads me to number five. A publicity stunt catapulted her career. In 1936, Dona led many musical orchestra acts, one known as Dona Drake and her girl band. She also created and toured with her all-girl orchestra named Rita Rio and her Rhythm Girls which was initially formed as a gimmick and publicity stunt that actually led to a fulfilling career. Also in 1936, Dona sang and danced opposite of Eddie Cantor in the film Strike Me Pink, but it didn't garner much buzz from Hollywood, which led to the publicity stunt of her forming the all-girl orchestra, which comprised of 12 to 15 women and became known as one of the best dance units during that time selling out ballrooms, hotels, and nightclubs. But 
during this time, girl bands and groups also faced criticism and were looked at as just eye candy and not taken seriously. But Donna was still praised for her beauty and writer reviews stated that it was essential that the leader such as Rita Rio be as glamorous as she was. She was also complimented for what was stated as her undulating torso, long chestnut colored hair, eyes, figure, and talent. She was also referred to as a Mexican tornado of rhythm and a stylist in her own right. Also prior in 1934, columnist Walter Winchell wrote about her performance in a nightclub, stating that her torso shifting serves to synchronize the tempos instead of Barron's directing. This young lady directs the tutors with her wiggling. People spoke of her stage presence as exciting and charismatic and that she was a firecracker of a performer. So what's fascinating about this is that we have a black woman passing as a Spanish woman leading an all white female orchestra. Now, what are the odds of that in the 1930s? Number six, she had a diverse career. With her stunning looks and all of her talents combined, Donna Drake had a very diverse career. Now we already know that she was a talented singer and musician that could play several instruments. But in the early 1940s, Donna made her transition over to acting. So on her own, she did a few short films and two rulers, which are short films that last about 15 to 24 minutes. She also sang on the airwaves and radio to market herself. Dorothy Lamour, an actress and good friend of Donna's who had known her from New York, recommended her to her film's producer, Buddy De Silva, and assisted in getting Donna signed with Paramount. And at this time is when the studio decided to change her name to Donna Drake. And they promoted her by building up her Latina brand and by sending out resumes on her behalf, which described her as Mexican, Irish, and French descent. Donna's first film for the studio was Aloma of the South Seas in 1941. She then added her flair to Bob Hope's film, Louisiana Purchase in 1941. Now it was also rumored that Bob Hope was smitten with her and had a crush on her and wanted to make sure to involve her in as many of his film projects as possible. She also played an Arab in the Hope Crosby Lamour comedy Road to Morocco in 1942. Eventually, due to her being typecast as a spicy singing support in which she mostly played ethnic roles, the studio dropped her contract. Donna's response to this was, It was wonderful at first. I thought I was on my way to becoming a film actress. But you can't make a screen career out of combing Lamore's hair or chasing Bob Hope in one picture after another. When I would tell this to Mr. De Silva, who was always very nice to me, he would tell me just to be patient that my turn was coming. Now, as for the highlights of her acting career, it was reported that she was best known for playing an American Indian maid alongside Betty Davis in Beyond the Forest. She also had a non-ethnic, non-musical role as a second female lead in the 1949 comedy, The Girl from Jones Beach. A year prior, she gave a memorable performance in the film, So This Is New York, as a fortune-hunting sister. She also had a lead role in a lower budget film as a band leader in a movie titled Hot Rhythm, which also starred Irene Ryan, the actress who played the grandmother on the Beverly Hillbillies, as a ditzy secretary. Now, in between film projects, Donna still performed at Hollywood nightclubs and to support the war effort and soldier morale, she appeared on the covers of magazines as a pinup model on publications such as Yank and the Army Weekly. Because she had begun her career as a singer and dancer, some rumblings came about that she was not an actress and Donna replied to that by stating, of course, I'm not an actress, but other studios thought I was worth borrowing for good parts and made an offer for me, all of which Paramount turned down. You know perfectly well that you don't have to be an actress to go over in pictures. Among girls my age, how many are there on the screen who can act? The secret of screen success is largely a matter of a good part and a good director. He's the guy who holds your fate in his hands. Even Betty Davis can go sour without a good director. 
while one who knows his business can make most any average girl look as if she really had talent. Now around this time, Dona had also gotten married, which brings us to number seven. Dona married William Travilla, a famous artist and fashion designer especially known for designing clothes for Marilyn Monroe. David Travilla was a multiple Oscar and Emmy nominee and an Academy Award winner for The Adventures of Don Juan, but perhaps he is best known for dressing the late, great Marilyn Monroe. He designed the iconic white dress from The Seven Year Itch that catapulted Marilyn's career and the costumes for Gentlemen Prefer Blondes and How to Marry a Millionaire. So he is responsible for one of my favorite Marilyn looks, the pink dress from Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. He also designed costumes for the film Valley of Dolls and won an Emmy in 1985 for the television series Knots Landing. He also designed uniforms for United Airlines and Frontier Airlines that were well known for their comfort and stylish designs. Travilla had been a gifted artist, but it was reported that due to being deemed unfit for the army due to his flat feet, he became sought after by Hollywood actresses. He designed for many actresses, which led him to a meeting with Marilyn Monroe, and he designed costumes for her in eight of her films. In 1944, he married Donna Drake, and they met while she was filming 1944's Hot Rhythm at Monogram Pictures. A friend, Joan Blondell, introduced her to him. After just 10 days of knowing each other, they married on August 19, 1944 at Santa Monica City Hall. It was reported that Dona was dressed in a plaid cotton shirt, a pair of Levi's, a bandana headdress with an orchid corsage supplied by her fiance. Travilla even joked that my wife turned down a $5,000 a week contract in Las Vegas because now she had a husband to support her. Now, they were married until her passing in 1989, but they also separated in 1956, but remained married. They also had one daughter named Nia Novella. Also around this time, it was not legal for interracial marriages, so it was reported that Dona kept her marriage a secret for almost a month. Number eight, she dated a mob boss. In 1936, Dona Drake was questioned by the FBI about the slain Russian-born mobster known as Luis Pretty Amberg. It was reported that she met him early on in her career while appearing in nightclubs, Club Paradise in particular, and that allegedly she was his girlfriend at the time. Amberg was known for his short temper and allegedly their relationship ended when he went missing but was later found unalived inside of a car in Brooklyn. When questioned by the FBI, it was reported that Dona stated that she had no idea what he did for a living and claimed he was respectful and polite and that his gifts were tasteful. She stated that they enjoyed horseback rides through Central Park and that she only knew him as Cohen and claimed that all he bought her was candy. Number nine, Dona Drake is the real life version of the imitation of life. So if you've never read the book or watched the movie, Imitation of Life is a heartbreaking story revolved around a black woman whose white passing daughter disowns her black heritage and mother for a better life. It's also about a white woman who takes that mother and daughter into her home as she aspires to become a successful actress. Now the movie is gut-wrenching and if you've seen it, you know how emotional that last scene is. And to be honest, it is still very hard for me to watch that last scene. That movie really made me understand and cherish a mother's love. Now the character who passed for White reminds me a lot of Dona Drake and her story. I see a lot of similarities. This movie came out in 1934 and another version in 1959. During the early 20s and 30s, there were some African Americans who were passing or attempting to pass as white to live a better life. But with passing, it meant you had to cut off all association and ties with your black family and never look back. You really had to take on a whole new identity in life, which is a tragedy and heartbreaking within itself. And this was a very dangerous thing to do because if you got caught, well, we all know what happened if you got caught. 
So passing was a thing. And in the black community, we come in all different shades from very, very dark to very, very fair. Now, as far as Donna Drake is concerned, I don't know if she disowned her family or cut off her connection with them, but it was reported that her mother once had to pass as her maid in a hotel while traveling. So it's not clear if during her time of passing as a different race, if she was still in touch with her family and able to keep their identities or their connection a secret, or if she had minimal to no contact. Number 10, she was a true chameleon. Now with all of Donna Drake's beauty and talent, I think her biggest talent and superpower was being a chameleon. I don't know anyone that could have pulled this off the way she did it. Being a black woman pretending to be a Mexican woman in 1930s and 40s Hollywood and having such a diverse career as she did. I think her biggest talent was adapting. Apparently she knew how to maneuver and go with the flow. I can only imagine how difficult it was for her to be a singer, dancer, actress, pinup model, musician, orchestra leader, all while concealing her identity and carrying the weight of what if someone finds out. She was so diverse and adaptable, not only with her career and her name changes, but her looks and her styles. She had several different looks. It was as if she had the ability to effortlessly take whatever form or shape she needed, like a shapeshifter. I also wonder if she developed this superpower by seeing how her parents or people in her family that may not have been as light or fair-skinned as she was, seeing how they were treated lesser than she was. She was so stunning and has such a unique look. And I wonder if she understood her uniqueness and she used it as a gift to propel herself and if she did what she felt she needed to do. She seemed like a hustler and a go-getter and the epitome of, I can do whatever it is I want to do and you can't stop me. Also, what I think helped her is that back in those days, a lot of people, when they were passing during those times, they were passing for white. But she didn't pass for white, she passed for Mexican. Because to a lot of people, she didn't look black, but she also didn't look white. So I feel like she found a middle ground and she just rode it right on through. And it worked. She literally took her God-given talents and found a way to use them before anyone could deny her of them. And I think that's brilliant. And last but not least, number 11, she was Hollywood's best kept secret. Now, I wonder if Hollywood knew her real identity. I wonder if her husband, Travilla, knew her true identity and heritage, or if the people around her knew. Part of me believes they didn't know it first, and then if they did know at some point, they chose to take a blind eye because she was making them money and giving them what they needed. And if she was willing to keep it a secret, hey, so were they. But the bigger question is, why does this story seem hidden? I research vintage stories and actors all the time, but it wasn't until recently that I came across Donna Drake and her story. And I'm shocked with it being as fascinating as it is. I feel like this story deserves a movie, a documentary. It deserves to be told. And as an actor, this would be the kind of a role that I would want to be cast in because it has so many layers. Donna had so many layers and she was multifaceted and her stakes were so high. I would love to know what she felt mentally and internally and be able to show that while telling her story. Her plight was so heavy and sad in a way, but also beautiful and inspiring in a way. From her living in secret and having to deny who she was, to being an entertainer, to dating a mob boss, I would just love to know more about her in general. Like I mentioned earlier, there is not a lot of information about her on the internet, but I just wish there were some interviews or some more information about her because I can tell that this is only a glimpse. I can tell her life was full of energy and vibrancy and charisma, 
just by doing the story on her, so I can only imagine how intriguing she was in real life. Unfortunately, Donna Drake passed away due to pneumonia and respiratory failure in Los Angeles, California on June 20th, 1989 at the age of 74. She was cremated and her ashes were scattered at sea. I hope that her story and her legacy lives on and that we all get to know that she was here. Not just the many identities and names and the persona that she took on that all became known to be Donna Drake, but that Eunice Westmoreland was here. And I hope that her story inspires you to know that you can do anything that you put your mind to and that anything is possible. So what are your thoughts about Donna Drake? Did you know about her and did you find her life as fascinating as I did? Please share your thoughts and comments in the comment section. And if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for hanging out with me and until next time.